Thanks, Jack. And now we'd like to start a roundtable discussion of our two states that represent the system of engagement uh, to get a better understanding of exactly how this process changed their respective DOTs. And to start that conversation, let me turn to Jack to lead that conversation. Thanks very much, Terry. Thanks for organizing all of this and also bringing us together. And, and I especially want to say thanks to Greg and to Steve and um, Bran and Barry. Uh, sharing real stuff as a way of uh, teaching or, uh, is so much more powerful than uh, you know reading it in a book or studying it uh, because you're getting the essence of real experience. And uh, so I I like this uh, notion of not only presenting, that is real people presenting to real people uh, in the same vernacular in the same domain, but also this, this next stage of the little presentation is conversation as a way of, of learning and, uh, and sharing with each other. So I have a bunch of questions of the, this morning's presentation uh, presenters, and uh, we can take this any direction that uh, the little group here uh, wants to, but you better first turn on your Turn on your um, your displays. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> You're making me feel less lonely. And uh, Steve and Barry, yeah, that's good. Um, and Martin, if you're there, turn on your turn on your screen as well. It'd be good to have you in the conversation. Um, but if you're not, that's all right too. Look, uh, Steve, I was blown away by your analogy of this library. You know, like a uh, the medieval library versus the uh, you know the Renaissance library. It's like opening up and uh, making the geographic knowledge available to everywhere. What what I'm mostly interested in is what the impact has been on your organization. I mean, you you've got all of these apps out here, internal apps, external apps. How has it actually impacted the idea that you can actually come to this common place and grab an app and and have a purposeful app uh, serve you. I mean, do you see changes in the organization or not? Uh, certainly. And we, uh, the Winter Ops app, which I described, ha has been something that we frankly can't live without at this point. You know, we, we were a big snow state in New York and everyone from executives down to our operational managers um, in the field, uh, use that to track uh, the storm as it evolves to see where their vehicles are um, and to, to manage the event. I mean, that's a, that's a really important thing. They say at, at, in New York, the two biggest things that a uh, regional director does is deliver a capital program and perform snow and ice operations. So, I mean, that tool has become very important to us, but uh, even you know, environmental folks in the field, you know, they have that, uh, that, your, that ability to, to show yourself on the map. You can walk out in the map or walk out in the field and say, okay, where is the wetland boundary? You know, the, the, those folks in the field find it so useful to be able to go and, and see exactly where they are, you know, when they're performing their operations. So, you know, it's really become um, highly useful. We get, it's, <laughs> Uh, systems of engagement compared to like a system of record to me is the is the, the frosting on the cake versus the cake. You know, folks love the system of engagement because we build these systems, you know, uh, four or five years to build a system of record. The data is very difficult to get to. And finally, we we are giving the data back. You know, it makes people so you know, it's, it's invigorating to be able to have access that you don't have to go to the specialist who has that, you know, unique ability to traverse that data to, to get information out. A few years ago, uh, Steve, uh, 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 Gates, uh, Bill Gates had this book, he talked about operating at the speed of light. And uh, what I'm actually seeing and, and listening to you, this idea of you measure and you can react to things more or less in real time, whether it's directing snow plows or whatever it is. It, it's, um, and it's affecting all of us actually, not just with GIS, but uh, particularly with GIS, you know, people are measuring disease in one place and they're able to build plans dynamically. People are collecting the census in one place and people are able to manage the census workers. And I just, I'm so interested in how this 
idea of, I mean, we all say this word digital transformation, but it's actually, actually in front of my eyes, I'm seeing it inside of organizations. They're operating more and more and more in real time. Uh, has it helped uh, your people make better decisions? That's, a, of course, this golden ring thing that we all aspire to do is, is using the information to make better decisions. Yeah, uh, um, of course it does, because having information, particularly what GIS gives us is that God's eye view. You know, I hate to put it that way, but it's, it is a way of being able to look at the entire system you know, and see what's going on so you can manage all of it. We used to, you know, manage emergencies by, by getting reports in Word that would come periodically every four hours or whatever, and we try to organize and respond to that. Now we can see that information in real time. We right. can see the big picture. You know, it's really, it, operations is such an important part of what we do now, whether it's managing capacity, managing um, our maintenance activities, any of that. And, and this gives us the ability to see, you know, where are our plow trucks right now? We have an ice jam, you know, what, where are the long reach excavators in the state and how do we, you know, logistically go and, and, and deploy them? So, you know, having that information at your fingertips makes it a lot easier than having to make lots of phone calls I mean, there's the executive thing. That it, every emergency happens at uh, at five o'clock on Friday afternoon, right? And nobody's there. The, yeah. the experts, the systems experts aren't there. How do I get this information? It's 15 yeah. phone calls to finally get the person, have them get in the office to get access. Now this information is available on any, uh, any mobile device from your home, anywhere, you know, uh, execs can get that information directly in real time you know, as opposed to having to go through that long string of, of, of yeah, folks. I'll just make the comment that it's more than just the apps and the maps that are engaging people. I think of it like an hourglass, you know, it's pulling data from many distributed data sets like you described into a kind of a funnel where there's this portal or you, the library with all those apps and then disseminating out to virtually everyone in the organization. And some of them, I guess, outside of the organization, this is, uh, so, so it's an architecture. It's not just engaging with maps and apps, you know. That's really neat. Uh, so I, I guess, Barry, I mean, you're implementing something very similar in the way of a pattern there. And I, I'm so curious about wh what you, um, what were the barriers that you faced actually in implementing this kind of technology? Were there naysayers or was everybody just jumped on board? <laughs> was it frictionless or was it your charm and your personality brought it all together or what, what, what did you do? Yeah, you know, when, when, uh, when uh, as we, as, as our current uh, executive team kind of came on board in, in 2016, uh, we, we, that first year we came into a series of state emergencies that were very significant. We had a lot of flooding in Louisiana, road closures, that type of thing. And I was with the secretary and, and we would get these stacks of uh, spreadsheets with all the road closures. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm looking at that uh, and coming from, from some of my background, I was used to seeing things more, using more GIS to implement that kind of stuff. So I started immediately trying to get everything organized to provide him a picture of where the roads were that were closed and he could see it on a one sheet of paper rather than looking at a stack of spreadsheets. <clears throat> and as we started looking at some of this, I started engaging Brad and some of my IT folks and along with the GIS folks to try to uh, figure out where we were at, where we, where we could go. Uh, and as we started looking at some of these things, you know, we had a lot of data out there, but mm -hmm. we had no easy way to access that data. So we were looking for, you know, for a, you know, a single source of data that we, could be the kind of the data record that could, could pull all this information into all these different things that we wanted to be able to do with it, whether it's a response to emergency, like in our case, it'd be road closure maps or possibly into a, a project viewer like Brad mentioned earlier in his presentation. Uh, so when we get legislative inquiries, we could, we could look and see what was there, how much money has been expended, how much of the product's completed, what, uh, what's left to be done, uh, uh, you know, whatever other issues might be out there. Um, 
so when we first brought this idea of doing it, and, uh, and I started looking around, I actually I talked to New York, I talked to Utah, I talked to several states that were uh, already kind of working with uh, system of engagement with Esri. And I, I brought it to Brad and a few of my other uh, managers in there. And we, we looked at this was a good opportunity for us to get that data organized and get a, uh, uh, a you know, have one person that's responsible for that data, have all that information flow in, have a uh, data warehouse set up for all this data would flow in and we could pull it into these apps. And I'd talked to Keith and we'd kind of discussed that. So as I presented this to the executive staff, I got some pretty good buy-in right off the top. You know, Secretary was all about that. He was very interested in pursuing that. Uh, as we started rolling it out to the, the users of this, the people that were really going to be involved in it, we got a little pushback initially. So, yeah. uh, uh, you know, because they saw it as a new, or here's a, a, a new guy coming in with some new initiatives that he wants to implement. It's going to cause me more work and, and, and it's nothing. I'm not going to get anything out of it. <laughs> so as I talked to Keith about this a little bit and let him know what some of our challenges were going to be, you know, we, we looked at some things that we could kind of some low hanging fruit out there of some, of some applications that we could uh, maybe uh, uh, acquire and get in production real quick. And, yeah. and so, so as we brought the team together, you know, it was kind of crammed down everybody's throat initially, I'd say. And, but we brought everybody together in the auditorium. We, we had the initial briefs that we get, and we started rolling this out. And we identified, I think it was 64 apps uh, initially that we wanted to move into. <clears throat> and, uh, and But we identified some of those that we could implement almost immediately. And, yeah. um, and we did that. And it started getting buy-in. And now we, and you started, people started seeing the, how, how this would improve, re reduce their workloads, and, and how it made this uh, information accessible uh, and they wouldn't have to go around and search for it. So it, it really got quick buy-in and then we started getting more requests for more apps than we could do. Then we started having to have prioritization meetings to figure out what priorities we were gonna set because we could only implement so much at a time. So, so it, it, it did initially have a little pushback, but it grew legs real quick and then grew a life of its own. And, and now I think we have total buying across the whole department. You know, GIS traditionally, if I look back on my career, 50 years of, of working this, it's gone from really hard to less hard. Uh, and some aspects of it are pretty hard. I mean, building systems of record that transactionally are maintaining and so on, uh, and building this, the traditional stovepipes of, of data management and DOTs is a lot of work. And if you do it right, but what this is, is kind of like an overlay, like Keith described, you can overlay with web services so that you have to first be willing to serve your data to a common portal. That doesn't mean outside because some of it, it's not appropriate, but serverize the data. That's the way I describe it. And once you serverize the data and organize it in this portal, that becomes a platform for building apps. And uh, like you say, once you've got that there, I mean, you can build an app and hours or days uh, so this idea of low hanging fruit like the like uh, you know damage assessment or just what's going on these kind of quick reports are the way to get everybody to buy into it because they say oh i want some of that you know? <laughs> because uh, it's so uh, clear that it helps understanding uh, fast but yeah it, look i resist technology all the time. I mean, running Esri is people are coming to me with proposals, you know, we got to do this, Jack, we got to do that. And, uh, you know, I, I push back just like any smart executive would. But at the same time, what is exciting about this technology is you can see the results really quickly. It's easy to implement. It's cheap to implement compared to the investment in the IT infrastructure. And once it gets going, man, it's like you said, you do one and then another. Hey, give me some more of that. <laughs> the other thing I'd like to kind of highlight is that one of the things we had people wanted to get their data perfect before they implemented it into the system. And, 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 and I stress that we need to get it in. That will help yeah. identify the problems and what we need to fix and not try to get it perfect because you never get your data totally perfect. Amen. Yeah, uh, it's just uh, like also there's a lot of resistance sometimes by the data owners because I mean hell I built all this data. What do you mean somebody else is going to get the credit for it? Uh, 
and show it off. Uh, I, I want to do that. So on the other hand, what I've noticed is with this web services thing, uh, people still get the credit and they, they start to feel weird if they don't share their data into this common infrastructure. Uh, hey, I want to get my stuff in there so it's actually used. You know, it's the opposite of the old mentality uh, and openness, really. I mean, I love right. what O'Malley said about it. So, you know, foundation for democracy and better organization internally and so on. But also it's just dealing with the little uh, politics of an organization, getting everybody to collaborate around this kind of stuff. It, um, well, I, I just see it doing well. Let me move on, Brad. What, what, what are some of the big things that you found uh, really were the key elements to making this transformation happen? I'm interested in your Frank, you know, the, the real stuff. Oh, you're on mute, uh, Brad, sorry. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I always do that. Now it's got somebody else that did it. You're still on mute. Yeah? We'll get him around here <laughs> eventually. Uh, so is it on our side uh, that this is happening? I think it's on, it must be somehow in this, uh, the magic of Zoom. And by the way, Jack, this is Martin O'Malley. I'm here by audio. Uh, oh, you hey, cannot, Martin. you you cannot see me, but I can see you. And I've been, <laughs> nice to I see am, you. I'm blocked uh, on your side. Thank you. Um, th thank you your... very much. Thank you very much for your comments. It was just uh, very beautiful. The context that you set up because you were cool. one of the early leaders in making this all happen. Well, I wouldn't have done it without you. You and Esri were just huge co-creators with so many of our departments in Maryland. And to your point about the shift, I mean, I think increasingly people are realizing that while the old tradition of hold your information, don't share your information was the way we'd always done things, the new way, if they don't see my information, they're not going to know what my needs are within the organization. They're not going to know we're accomplishing things. And the other trick to that is lifting up the leaders. I mean, yes. man, when you lift up the leaders on the map because of their excellence and accomplishment, boy, does that get people playing along in the collaborative enterprise. This kind of co-evolves, doesn't it? Uh, yes. They're, 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 yeah, there's definitely a, what are you, you want to call it a synergy, a symmetry, uh, they both feed on each other, you know, the positive feedback uh, loops that that creates. I just say somebody's got to take the first action, then the other one responds, then the other one responds. I just like to see it as co-evolution. Hey, Brad, are mm -hmm. you, uh, can we hear you yet? Oh, man. This, on your side, it's fine. Uh, well, you could sign off and sign back in. We'll be, we'll carry on the conversation. Uh, Barry, what, what other things... Uh, do you think our success criteria that you've experienced down there in Louisiana? Well, you know, w one of the, the big things I think that, that's come out of this is a lot of the uh, applications that are being used on a day-to-day -day basis out there are really uh, making us a lot more efficient. And, and with the declining resources that, that we face or the, or the, or the, the needs that we see that keep building up with uh, you know, deferred maintenance and that type of thing, and then new new construction that we need to do. It's always it's always good to show our legislators to have that transparency out there where they can see the things that are going on, because uh, a lot of these things that they that we've done these applications for, it allows us to share that data, and people can see, the public can see, uh, actually, the level of things that we're doing on a day to day basis. And where they wouldn't necessarily see how hard our employees are working out in the districts on, otherwise. And we're always providing reports and updates for certain legislators and, and the public on things that we're doing within you know, certain parishes, certain uh, districts. And, and this helps us get that message out there so that they can see how our, the resources that we are being given are being put to good use and they can see that the things that uh, we say we're doing are actually, it's one thing to come in and brief, uh, you know, some people on what you're doing, but if they can come in and see it and, and see the work progress being done, it, it makes a big difference. Yeah, one of the big, uh, and uh, uh, 
I don't know if Brad, were, were we able to get back in? Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Hey. Okay. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. A solution. <laughs> but why don't, why don't you kick in and uh, tell us some of the big things that you saw? Sure. Sure. So, you know, the, the, the biggest thing and I've found in my career, this is often the case, is that uh, the hard stuff, you know, setting up the technology, given where we are today, was relatively easy. Um, it, it's it's not a technical problem. Right. So it, it was more the the interaction of the different teams that have to work together to get this stuff done, to make it a useful app. Once you get this data in the data warehouse and have these services up and running and then to come together and say, hey, what do, what question are we asking of this and what do we need to answer this question? Um, but that, I think, is a strong point. You know, Keith talked about in, in his uh, speech or his presentation a while back about, you know, the implementation plan providing organizational suggestions. And I think those were invaluable. For this. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't exactly as presented, but it, it was absolutely something that, that had to make, you know, makes any project go, obviously. But using those uh, suggestions in the implementation plan, applying them to our specific situation, and then executing that, I think, uh, was the biggest part of the success in this. And it, it led to all those things that Barry talked about, to the steamroll, steamroll, snowball effect of folks who were, you know, kind of leery of it before, wanting more than we can give them at this present time now. So what, what were your keys to making it successful at your level uh, among the various teams that were there? Right, so I, I think a big key, um, was we had generally three different major, four different major groups with Esri uh, working to get this together. And there were, you know, I had folks on my team who are essentially business analysts, kind of liaisons that are used to connecting folks together. I assigned one to each of the major groups, made sure that everyone was talking the same language, that everyone was understood. And I think that that went a long way towards gelling the teams together. Yeah, you know, I keep uh, thinking about the infrastructure, Bill. You guys must be thinking about it day and night. <laughs> you know, these sort of maps that the governor showed of, uh, you know, critical uh, bridges versus where the money is going. Uh, if, if this comes about, and I, I guess that's still a big if, but isn't it going to hemorrhage money on the different DOTs? And you've got, got to come up with rapid maps that, bring all that data together to be able to target and move quickly. I mean, I, I guess I'd kind of like your sense of it. Steve, why don't you start off? Are you prepared for this? Are you <laughs> setting up the system of engagement to do these well, manipulations? Or? Yeah, Jack, I'm doing a lot of thinking about it. I'm collaborating with some colleagues on, on uh, paper about it. And I'm thinking about it in terms of what is the intersection of asset management operations management and these systems of engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Because through asset management, we can look at how do we optimize our investment in pavements? How do we optimize our investments in bridges? How do we do portfolio analysis where we trade off pavements and bridges and to get the best possible conditions? And what I'm hoping with an infrastructure bill is Rather than just you know put together a traditional listing of projects in particular, do we take a programmatic look, and that we use these tools to be able to look statewide? And I was taken by what Governor O'Malley showed about you showing um, where the bridges were in Minnesota and the, the various conditions, and where the investments are. And what I'm hoping with that we take more of an asset management view with the with the bill. And that we are making investments that, you know, essentially the, be a rising tide that, you know, that raises all the boats, that we're able to get the transportation system to a state of uh, good repair, a state of healthy operations. So we're making these investments in a targeted way, but also that we begin to bring in things that uh, we really need to think about more now, like climate change, investment in underserved communities, you know, a lot of other things that, that we need to think more about in a modern DOT, you know, instead of looking back at what I, what I fear is we don't want to make investment strategies saying, you know, 30 years ago, if we had all this money, we would, you know, we would do this project or that project. Mm -hmm. 
the world we live in today, how do we make the system sustainable, right? Um, how do we make it healthy in a way that will stay healthy going forward? And how do we, with a built out system, we, you've got to admit most of the transportation systems are built out. How do we continue to, to get the most operational use out of the system, out of the system as it is to manage the capacity? And there's all kinds of tools that in, in SOE to help us manage our work zones, to help us manage incidents and, and, and accidents and all of that, but also to be able to quickly reflect if we do this investment strategy, here these, this will be the condition of the various highways in the state. Uh, this investment strategy will affect the bridges in a certain way. So that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping we take a holistic, programmatic, network-wide view um, of the system with the new bill. And I think that, that uh, uh, the SOE um, ability to show all of this in a map really quickly what the trade-offs are of different investment strategies should help us considerably with that. You know, Governor, I'd really be interested. I mean, you had an idea uh, when President Obama was uh, spending all of this almost trillion dollars of putting out a kind of system of engagement in that recovery uh, map. Can you explain uh, what you did there or how that all yeah, happened? Yeah, I'll, sh I'll share with everybody. It was a, it was, it was what you and you and I both did, Jack. I mean, what we saw was that Recovery and Reinvestment Act was going, you used the word hemorrhaging. I'd like to prefer that, to think of it as rain. Uh, it was going to <laughs> rain, rain, money. rain down uh, much needed dollars on yeah. uh, drought stricken state governments who had seen their revenues tank since their people lost their homes and lost their jobs. And uh, what we came up with and showed the, but then Vice President Biden and Earl Devaney, uh, uh, I do believe, uh, I don't think you were with me at this meeting, but I pulled him aside in the corner of uh, that, that West Room, the one with the Lincoln portrait at the White House. And I said, there is every reason to believe that you can immediately stand up the system that will show everybody where on a map that they're familiar with, their own state, their own county, their own neighborhood, where their own Recovery and Reinvestment Act dollars are landing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, for those that don't know this, it was just a map of lots of dots where all the money would go. That was his, uh, the governor's vision is where will the money go? Every, yeah, and, every particular project was put on that map. And you get, and some of the people on this call will remember the big craze was shovel ready project, shovel ready project, we yeah. want to go shovel. But there were other projects. There was the water projects, there was extended unemployment benefits, there were education benefits. And, and Esri with Maryland created really the beta case for how any state could show their own citizens where these dollars were landing. And it was a beautiful thing to observe. Every morning I'd go on the federal website and you could see another state colored in with that platform. It was pretty, uh, pretty, it was made very simple and intuitive by Esri and Earl Devaney afterwards uh, believed and has said several times that the reason he believes there was so little waste, fraud or abuse, though widely predicted, uh, was because for the first time in American history, 300 million Americans could actually see if they cared to go on the internet, where those dollars were landing. And it was that openness and transparency that led to the level of trust that allowed, you know, allowed us to, to do the recovery and do the projects without half the world feeling like, oh, somebody else must be getting more than we are. You could show everybody on a map. And for all of the diminished trust in our world today, there is still an integrity and a trust and a truthfulness that comes from showing people on a map that they can verify with their own eyes uh, where things are happening. Well, I think system of engagement has two meanings. One is internal, and all, all of you guys have talked about the applications that were internal that help uh, open up the and provide access to the information inside the agency for the agency. And then there's this other system of engagement where you can communicate and get feedback from citizens. And it's a little higher risk there, uh, and you have to work, work it very carefully. But the there is at least one experience that I've seen at the national level and many that are at the state level where this communication to the citizens and getting their buy-in and maybe even input about where the money should go 
uh, was very uh, was was extremely valuable. So it's the same. It's actually the same thing that you've already done. Well, uh, I think we're running out of time. But uh, or Terry, do we have more time? Can we? Uh, I, I think this was our scheduled uh, ending, but uh, uh, I'm so if you'd like well, to close well, it off. Uh, let me just uh, uh, walk around the room here. Steve, do you want to say anything else that might be able to be helpful to the other listeners from the other DOT, the other executives that are online and looking at this? Uh, just it, it, it is the, the bang for the buck. The amount of benefit that you get for the amount of effort compared to building these traditional systems of record and yeah. liberating data and making it widely available to your organization is a huge breakthrough for us. You know, we've spent millions of dollars building these systems of record and, and shared that information. It, 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 we've not been able to share it in a way that we really need to. A typical resident engineer, regional director, need data from all kinds of different sources, right? And this is just a wonderful way to layer it up. And for the first time we're putting, you know, um, <laughs> you know, I joke about putting roads on maps, right? <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> right, what, what, what an innovative thing for a department of transportation, but most of our data exists in filing cabinets, exists mm -hmm. in spreadsheets, exi exist in tabular form. Um, we're working a lot with unstructured data now. We're trying to figure out how to get all that controlled correspondence. It's like somebody asked about Route 20 from point A to point B. What, what correspondence have we had with local officials or whatever on this in the past? What studies have we done? Everything that you have in your office, whether it's in a filing cabinet, a spreadsheet, a database, a huge system, can be brought out and put on a map. And when you're doing a project, you can know the entire history, the, 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 the work that's been done, the record plans, um, accident history, uh, all of that, make it really accessible, really easy, easy. To me, convincing someone to do an SOE should be a very simple thing to do because it is a great investment. You know, yeah. you are, you're now, like I said, it's that huge, that difference between the medieval library and the Renaissance library. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, other, the other thing, you know, frankly, in this conversation we didn't talk about, which is really important, is that your colleagues in other state agencies and federal agencies and in cities are doing the same thing. They're all beginning to serve their data as not just open data. I mean, what do you do with open data? It's kind of difficult, but open map services. So you can mash up and overlay fish and game data or environmental data or land use data or population data uh, and bring it into your operation. So your own people are, you use the word holistic, holistic thinking, holistic planning, holistic operations. Uh, and you in turn are providing your data out for these other agencies to bring in uh, and, uh, and, and mash up. So, yeah. well, Barry, what, what about any final thoughts from you? Yeah, and I definitely have to echo everything that uh, Steve said. That uh, with that, you know, giving us access to the data, uh, forcing us to clean up the data that we did have, and to break down those stovepipes out there to uh, allow us to produce these applications that we could help our internal effort. Uh, but also uh, provide some information out externally and help increase that transparency to give uh, us uh, additional confidence with the public and the uh, legislators that we're mm -hmm. uh, out there trying to work with and support on a daily basis yeah. with all the partners that we have. You know, the, there was an old story about uh, data. People were afraid to share data because they were afraid people would notice that there's inaccuracies in it. You, know, you ever run into that? <laughs> you know, my data is not good enough to share. Uh, well, what, what, uh, here's sort of Jack's rule. The more you share it, the better your data gets. <laughs> because, totally you know, true. Hell Absolutely. may come raining down on top of you because, oh, your data is bad. Okay. So, well, I need money to fix it up. Right. So <laughs> this, this, uh, this fear naturally takes care of itself. Uh, so we have to encourage people and nurture people to, uh, you know, do that, do the right thing. 
Well, Brad, what about uh, at your scale in your efforts? Do you have any final comments to share with the other uh, DOT leaders? Sure, sure. So, you know, I think we've all talked about, um, you know, the liberation of all this data in these district business systems has its own value and, you know, the efficiencies that it brings. But I think it also helps to serve as a platform for that holistic business decision making, right? So not only can you get to the data now, but you can use it, mash up, like you said, all these different things to better inform that more holistic decision making and where these projects go and why kind of they go there. So I, I think we're certainly um, a lot farther than I thought we'd be. And uh, <laughs> there's, there's miles to go. <laughs> it's so it's so much fun when you start to get that ramp that takes off like that. It's sure. Well, uh, Governor, do you have any final thoughts for us? I mean, this was not planned. I so appreciate you uh, joining us. Any other no, thoughts? I just, other DOTs? Yeah, I just, yeah, I just want to encourage all of the leaders of the DOTs to, um, you know, it, it seemed to me in my view of things, and I work a lot with Grant Thornton, uh, yeah. as well as uh, interact with 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 Esri. It seems that transportation departments are really the leading edge of this new way of governing, with open mm. transparency, with the gut t- transparency, the guts to measure better results for our citizens. And um, this is a time of enormous opportunity, I, I believe, uh, for all of for all 50 states, for for all of you really to restore the trust we need in our democracy to accomplish what our kids and grandkids deserve from our republic. So thank you for what you're doing to advance the game and advance the practice. Yeah, my, my thought is that DOTs in the IT space have sometimes been lingering, slow. They're not right at the cutting edge, but what's occurring, and these <laughs> three examples, uh, including your own state with Gary's talk this morning, uh, are showing the light of uh, what you say, a new way of governing, which is more connected, uh, more transparent, uh, more right. collaborative, uh, more, uh, I'll use Steve's words, more holistic in the way that they're doing it. And, you know, transportation is the footprint that enables everything else, all the land uses, all the uh, you know, changes that occur in the landscape. And uh, you mentioned also a word, Steve, about uh, sustainability. We need to we need to think holistically in these next, you know, few years. What we put in place is going to last for decades. And I, I really see if this transportation infrastructure bill passes. I mean, this will be the chance of a lifetime. You know, people talk about the Eisenhower era of the big highways that were built. Uh, it's once in a career <laughs> something like this could happen. And I'm not saying it's happened yet, but it, it looks like at least it's promising. And how we build the nation's infrastructure, not only what it is, but also how we build it, I think will shed, uh, we'll have lots of repli- um, uh, repercussions on how government in general, I like what you said, Governor, uh, how governor, uh, government in general responds to creating a more sustainable future. That's basically the words that I'll conclude with on this thing. We all have to, I mean, look, we're all in this, man. I mean, we have to work hard to create, do everything we possibly can to create a sustainable future. And right now it's, it's, as you read, it's, uh, there's, it's some dicey times and uh, this, you will be, you will be, all of you listening will be the, the ones really who, play such a critical part in creating this next generation of sustainability. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Terry, did you have any final thoughts that you wanted no, to No, I, I wanted to thank our speakers. Uh, really, this was, uh, I think, uh, just a you know, outstanding event. And I hope it was, uh, uh, I want to thank all of you. And I want to thank the listeners. I hope this was a very useful uh, experience for you as well. So. And yes, thanks, everybody. I'll just say we're going to sign off. See you later. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Nice to see you, Governor.